welcome back so in previous lecture we discussed about the uh, the fold growth and segmentation so before we get into the detail of this part here uh, that is the northwestern uh, portion of the janavari anticline i'll just try to explain in two slide that how this interaction of the two segments took place so if you look at the overall uh, uh, topography here then as I explained that this portion is uh, the uh, the segment of linkage between the two uh, segments of the Janavari anticline and when it, it linked up it resulted in the formation of 100 kilometer long fold range. So this is just a model which has been given here so which explains that initially uh, this for segment uh, Janavari anticline segment 2 and 1 uh, started propagating uh, uh, away from uh, like from the center here in either direction and then they got linked up. So, uh, so before the linkage the shuttle used to flow through this gap and after the blocking of this two that is the merging of the link uh, area linked up area and this was blocked and it forced the, the channel to flow uh, on the on along the parallel almost parallel to the the uh, the Janavari anticline along the bank, bank back link of the of of uh, this major feature, okay. and further now after the linked up, this portion start growing up, okay. and this is what uh, we will be discussing in the next coming slide, and that how this uh, was responsible. So initially, this bias also flowed without any, having any interference from this tip. But now what we see is that Bias has been pushed further northwest because of the uh, the growth on the on the tip of the uh, the Janavari anticline. So coming to this part again, as I have already discussed, so these are the two uh, faults which are propagating in northwest direction and pushing the further northwest. And we did our paleoseismic studies over here, so this I'll explain in coming slides. So this is the uh, the sketch of uh, the geomorphic map which we have prepared, which shows that the bias uh, is present. This is the present-day channel here, and this is the uh, uh, the paleo uh, floodplain. And bias used to flow through this earlier, and then slowly it moved further northwest. So after doing the tectonic geomorphology part, we started looking at a detailed uh, topography of the active fault and that what we see here uh, this is a shaded relief map which shows the the young topography of uh, the active fault displacing uh, very young deposits of Bias river. So if you look at this portion here and then on ground you will be able to see this exactly the same this also ex I, I, I have shown this uh, photograph earlier also and then uh, this is the topography of that one coming to this part here where we did uh, detailed paleo seismic studies we opened up the trenches over here one trench here another one here so I'll explain one of the trench from this portion now we also did because if you look at the the topography here uh, what we see is that you have uh, like the, the higher scarp here and further if you move along the strike towards the, the direction of propagation then this uh, the height reduces and this is because the, uh, the this portion of the scarp is showing the cumulative displacement uh, whereas this one is taking the younger one. So the height is clearly picked up from the topographic profiles which we extracted from a digital elevation model. So, if you look at the A A dash, B B dash, C C dash, and D D dash, what we see is the topography here of which is, which is closer to the front here or the hills. It has a higher topography, and as you move further uh, along the strike here, then the topography reduces. So this clearly indicates that the fall, fall, fault and fold is propagating in this direction. So the height close to the this portion was around 15 meters 
um, in some areas and, uh, and reduces up to up to 5 meters or up to 2 meters further in the northwest direction. So coming to this part here uh, where we did the detailed value seismic studies. So we initially we took the topographic profile of this false cup and the, the false cup was not at all disturbed by any anthropogenic activity. So we, we selected this site keeping in mind that this uh, of course when we say the anthropogenic activity that means this has not been modified uh, uh, by the human activity. So before we got into the trenching business we did uh, uh, in a GPR profile and this shows the 3D GPR profile section and we were able to pick up clear cut deformation at this level. Okay. So in this, the, the depth here is almost like more than 8 meters and we can see the fault which is very prominently uh, uh, seen along with the deformation of the sediments up to 6 meter or so. So even we did 3D slicing, now the, uh, the, uh, the higher uh, contrast between uh, this two it shows clearly that you have the softer deposits here or finer deposits and these are all uh, gravels. Now how we are able to say that these are gravel when we opened up the trench we were able to see the contrast between the sediments. So this is another topograph, uh, the topographic profile uh, which we use to, uh, to do the topographic corrections and the GPR profile and the section again you see what we go we went up to more than like if you take this as 5 meters then you have uh, more than more than 7 to 8 meters over here and fault we were able to easily pick up up to uh, 6 to 8 meters depth and also the deformation so this is your northeast side so this is your upthrown block and this is your downthrown side so this is your foot wall so this is this part is your towards the Indo-Gangetic plain, and this is towards the uh, uh, the uh, the sub Himalayas. So this portion we opened up because we were not able to go deeper. Um, so we opened up the trench here, uh, which was almost like uh, if you take this one length here, it was almost like uh, 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 16, and if you put more here, almost like uh, close to 18 meters. And the depth was not much, hardly uh, uh, 2 to 3 meters deep we were able to go. But with, uh, with the help of the, uh, the trench section and the, uh, the GPR, we, will be, we were able to extend the fault in, uh, deeper up to 8 meters uh, like this. So, so we, what we, we identified from this, that this portion of the fault strand, that is your F1, is showing the older deformation and the younger deformation was been taken up by this one. Now this again was based on what uh, the experiment we did in sandbox that the younger deformation will be taken up by the, uh, the, the another fault in the frontal side. But nevertheless as we have seen in one of the, uh, uh, the lecture that deformation can also be taken up by the older faults in some cases. But in this it was very clear because it deformed the younger deposits. Hence we, we concluded at least before getting into the, uh, the trenching that this uh, F2 uh, has, uh, has taken up the young deformation along the, along the Himalayan frontal thrust. So trenching part, we opened up the, the trench here. So GPR profile was taken across this one and then we started digging. So this is our uh, a final photo mosaic of north wall uh, which shows clear s deformation uh, that is the, uh, the folding of, of the, uh, the gravel and the sand layer climbing up on the, on the finer deposits. So the contrast in the GPR which you were showing in the red, okay, more contrast and the lesser contrast here was the uh, difference between the sediment uh, size and the, uh, the the type of the deposits. Close up of that, so you can easily make out a deformation here, which can be drawn like this. Okay, so we have a contact here. This is a sharp contact of the fault. Okay. So this I am drawing very rough, but the sketch which you will see here is something like that. Okay. 
So, you have still along with this uh, main fault, we, we see some imbricated faults which are coming uh, out of this. Okay, And this is on the small miniature scale, but on the large scale or the mega scale also you see similar type of deformation what we were trying to explain uh, from the sandbox model. And also if you look at the, the cross section, schematic cross section of Himalaya, so we have the older faults and the younger faults which are uh, taking up the deformation in the uh, foreland side. Now, the, the idea was that okay, fine, after preparing the detailed sketch based on the different units which were been identified uh, from uh, the exposed trench wall, that we have the, the sand units and the sharp contact here, and different units were been identified, like what we, we, we have shown here is A, B, and then you have the C here. Okay, C is your colluvium. Uh, colluvial which is capping the uh, this all faults uh, the small uh, these so branching out fault like F A F A F A F B and F C and the main fault is your F two and as I explained in the G P R profile that we consider this as resulted into the young displacement and we focused on this one and you you see the final capping uh, by by unit D. So, based on this cross cutting relationship, we picked up the samples uh, from different units. So, we were lucky to have some samples of charcoal, like from here we got charcoal, and then and, and from another location, like here we got uh, some charcoal. Rest of the, the samples we did with OSL. So, uh, this is another exercise which usually has been done that we have a very long topographic profile not only just confining to the, the trench area but we try to take the topo topographic profile further um, up in the in the scarp area as well as the um, undeformed region and then we place our trench and this helps us in understanding that what is the the total displacement because this top is your what we found is the gravel here and the the, the same unit uh, is sitting down here on the on the foot wall side. So this is the hanging wall and this is the foot wall side. So the total displacement what we found between the uh, the gravel uh, uh, displacement of the gravel unit was almost like eight meter, but the same was not been uh, seen during this scarp. That is the young scarp here. The displacement what we found was much much less. So finally, what we uh, concluded from this that at least two major events occurred along uh, the F1 and F2 fault strengths and F2, F1 is not been seen in the trench, but F1 was been picked up in GPR profile. So, event 1 along F1 strength occurred between 2600 years and 800. This was been uh, based on the ages which we got uh, from this unit. So, gravel we were unable to date, but the, but the sand lens which was uh, within the gravel uh, we were able to date that and that gave us an age of 2600 years. So, we have bracketed this between uh, this age and the capping age of this unit that is your unit B here. So, we have the, the age of this. So, we have capped this two events between this one. So, we say that okay fine the event 1 which was along F1 was uh, between 2600 years and 800 years whereas event 2 was along this F2 and that occurred between 400 years and 300 years. So, 400 years the age is here we got and then 300 years we say is based on the this age okay. because this is this has been kept by this colluvial material. So, we, we have this age. So, given the dating uncertainty it is suggested that the event 2 that is this one was probably the uh, the event which was uh, which was recorded uh, in the historical data that occurred around 1555 AD and the the penultimate event was along F1 which has not been seen in this trench. So finally uh, what you see here is that you have the F1 here and the F2 which is which has taken up the the at least uh, the long younger event here. 
So this you can compare easily what we saw in GPR and what we we, we were we were able to see in the section here uh, of the trench. So interpretations we have that the new four active fault trays were identified in the frontal portion along the HFT system and associated Janovri anticline. Evolution of the 100 km long Janovri anticline is a product of linkage of two smaller segments. So this I am I'm trying to give you the complete overall evolution of uh, not only the events and uh, but but we are talking about the evolution of the landscape so it this was the result of the linkage of two smaller segments and event one occurred uh, between 2600 and 800 years and event two during 400 and 300 years and event two probably represent the 1555 uh, AD earthquake in this region now this is how we are going to uh, interpret the different trenches. I will give one more lecture uh, on, um, um, uh, from central Himalaya where we opened up the trench and which gave us an evidence of uh, 1505 earthquake in that region. Now coming to the central Himalayan part, uh, we have another good uh, uh, example of similar fault propagation folding from this region an excellent example of the imbricated fault system also. So what we have is the, we have the Himalayan frontal thrust here, I will come to that in detail in the next slide and the frontal part is sitting here which is an imbricated fault from HFT. So this gives you a complete idea that on surface, so if you take the 2D view of this region, uh, this is a high resolution satellite photograph, this is the portion of HFT and the frontal part is this one right now which is which is taking up the deformation. So this is a part of the integrated fault of, of the HFT and this we have named as Kaladungi fault. So again uh, a very beautiful uh, uh, topography here which explains that how fold has grown over the time and how the landscape got evolved and what we see in terms of uh, the deflection of this stream one here that is your Dabka stream and another is Bohr stream. Now Bohr river flowed through this earlier so initially it flowed through this one here whereas the, uh, the Dabka river flowed through this one uh, before this uh, the fold propagated on either side. So as I have explained that the, uh, the fold will keep growing okay. So first it will it will grow like that okay and then second it will further grow like this and then further it will keep going like that okay. So it will acquire the, the displacement here as well as it will acquire the length along the along the strike okay. So it will keep growing radially as well as it will keep growing vertically also as the displacement has been taken up. So the streams which are flowing on this will keep on deviating for example which has been shown here so it will keep deviating here like that and then like this okay and further and the further what we see is that these streams are flowing on the either edges okay. So this uh, uh, paleo wind gaps okay are indicative of the uh, the previous channels which flowed so this is DWG1 is your uh, the, the river flowed through this initially and similarly you have the BWG1 that is the uh, bore wind gap and this is your Dabka wind gap and similarly then the next stage uh, as the fold uh, grow grew then this was the second location where it flow, flowed and then finally what we see is the, the present day. So detailed topographic uh, mapping of the landforms were been carried out and that what we call the geomorphic mapping or the detailed geomorphological map was been prepared and different terraces this we will talk what do you mean by terraces and all that in coming lectures but this is important right now what we see is the surfaces so we have the if we have to call terraces then it, it, it is something like that you have the channel and you have the terraces okay. So this is your uh, river channel and these are the, the terraces T0, T1 and all that okay. So what we did was we also marked the alluvial fan surfaces as well as we marked the different terraces. So in total we were able to pick up seven terraces 
uh, in this area and the alluvial fan surfaces also. So these are the all alluvial fan surfaces. We have a alluvial fan surface 1, alluvial fan surface 2 and alluvial fan surface 3 marked with different colors here. So this is your uh, AFS1, alluvial fan surface 1. And then you have the pink one is alluvial fan surface 2 and the green one is your alluvial fan surface 3 here. And then different terraces which have been marked here uh, along the, the front as well as along the, along the different small streams and within the gap also. So we have the, these, these are the gaps, wind gaps. We have DWG1 and for the bore, uh, BWG1, BWG2 and similarly you have 3 and 4 here. And the present day channel is flowing at the edge of this fold, that is uh, the, uh, the fold which has developed because of the displacement along the Kaladungi fault. So if you view uh, this in uh, uh, 3D perspective view, then it gives a complete bird eye view of the region. So this was the gap here, earlier gap was here of Dapka and similarly the final one is flowing across this. So this portion is having lesser height as compared to this one here. So this portion is having higher height and this portion is also the middle part. So this is having higher height uh, as compared to the edge of the, of the fold. So what we did was we after detailed uh, investigations uh, we identified that this portion of course is the, uh, the younger landform which was deformed. This is your T2 which has been marked here. So this will give us a most recent event if it has been displaced okay and that was sure that this got displaced and the fault runs over here. So uh, again uh, similar uh, uh, schematic diagram which we have prepared for this or uh, we have uh, tried to infer based on the, the deformation that we had an HFT here uh, but that no deformation was been seen here but this change in the topography allowed the, uh, the, the streams which were debouching into the endogangetic plane or on the endogangetic plane resulted into the formation of the Kaladungi fan and the Stevel river, uh, both the rivers still continued flowing um, across this one. But later the new fault uh, took up the deformation that is an imbricated fault of HFT and that what we named as in Kaladungi fault and it propagated on either, in either directions. Okay. So this resulted into final um, uh, not allowing the streams to flow across this one and force the streams to flow on the edges and that what we see an excellent example of the, the of fall propagation uh, and fall growth uh, because of the, the ongoing deformation taken up by Kaladungi fault. So this is what we see the final um, exit of these two rivers. Okay. So as I was talking that uh, the wind gaps, so this typically marks the topography in field. So what we see is the small uh, uh, like depression type but this depression is nothing but the, uh, the value of wind gap. Okay. So this was the, uh, the, uh, the river bed which is uplifted uh, along the Kaladungi fault which is running here. So this is your Kaladungi fault and this portion is your uh, paleo channel and this belongs to Bore River. So you will find such topography all along the strike of uh, the Kaladungi fan. Another photograph of this you have this wind gap of which was which was very wide we were not able to pick up in one shot but on the edge we found that this is your uh, the fourth wind gap of Dapka river. There is another one again you had the uplifted river bed of Bow river another uplifted river bed of the Bow river. So this marks your the most youngest fault okay. that is your Kaladungi fault an imbricated fault of from of HFT. So I will stop here and we will talk more about uh, the, the paleo seismic studies which was which were carried out in this region and we will discuss about the events and all that and how we collected the samples identified the different event horizons. Thank you so much. Thank you.